Boldwood presents The Cellar, written by John Nicoll and read by Jake Urry. The moral right of the author has been asserted. This performance is owned by Boldwood. Chapter One Marcus Gove stared at the wall clock high above the psychologist's head, willing the hands to move a little faster. He raised an open hand to his mouth, yawning at full volume and then rubbing his eyes as if struggling to stay awake. It was all part of his show. The persona he'd decided in advance to present that particular morning. Anything to make his mundane existence just that little bit more interesting. Is this going to take much longer, Doc? It's getting boring. The secure hospital's most experienced expert, Dr. Sally Barton, looked back at Gove, her senior nursing colleague, with a disdain it seemed she could no longer hide. Her professional identity was slowly disintegrating before Gove's eyes. Growing contempt was written all over her face. This assessment is part of the disciplinary process, Marcus. My report will inform the clinical director's decision regarding your future employment here at the hospital. You're an intelligent man, therefore you must realize your predicament. You need to take the process seriously. You're working with some of the country's most dangerous patients. As of now, I have serious doubts as to your suitability for the role. Gove's arrogant smirk became a full-blown belly laugh, head back, Adam's apple bouncing, dark mercury fillings in full view. There was much about working in a hospital for the criminally insane that amused him, and this experience was no different. He began picking his nose, knuckle-deep, flicking the snot over her right shoulder as if aiming at the wall. His manic laughter suddenly morphed into a smile, replaced seconds later by a frown, the toothy grin disappearing as quickly as it had appeared. The appointment was progressing much as he'd hoped. He'd anticipated her seeking to retain a professional persona despite his antics, and now it was happening, making it all the more delicious. So, I need to take this shit seriously, do I? Do I really? Is that so? Dr. Know-it-all has serious doubts about my therapeutic abilities. It would be funny if it weren't so pathetic. You are so full of crap, lady. The director is a bitch, and so are you. Gove watched as the psychologist slowed her breathing, steadying herself, sucking in the air before releasing it. The strain was getting to her. She was usually so calm, self-assured and composed, but not now. There was a sheen of sweat on her brow, which pleased him. He'd liked to have licked it away. He considered it briefly, but decided against it. He wasn't ready to bring the interaction to a close. Everything was going his way. The bitch was squirming. Ha! There was more fun to be had. Gove silently acknowledged that he was starting to enjoy himself. He studied the psychologist closely as she prepared to speak, her lip trembling ever so slightly, her facial muscles tense. The second hand on the clock was moving a little faster now, time passing more quickly. Your behavior has become extremely concerning, Marcus. You're alleged to have had an overfamiliar relationship with a patient, a man with paranoid schizophrenia, a predator who killed seven women before disposing of their bodies. It doesn't get any more serious than that. Gove began rocking in his seat, his eyes wide, popping. You said alleged. It was alleged, alleged, alleged. Doesn't that suggest an element of doubt on your part? It seems you're not nearly as clever as you like to think you are, Doc. He repeatedly jabbed out a finger, pointing towards the three framed academic certificates on the wall to his left. Maybe all those flashy paper qualifications aren't worth shit. All those years of study were a complete waste of time and effort. You're a bad joke, Doc. How much good do you do? Fuck all. That's the truth of it. You come here, day after day, spouting your mindless nonsense to no good effect. Surely you must have realized that by now. Anyone with even half a brain would understand that reality. 
You're a non-person, an irrelevance. Such a sorry sight to witness. How very sad to behold. Maybe you should crawl off and die somewhere in a dark hole where others wouldn't have to suffer your vile attentions. I'm sure I would in your place. I couldn't stand the shame of it all. To have wasted one's life as you have, deluded by an unjustified sense of self-importance. You're no more than a wallflower, with your expensive clothes, permed hair and makeup. You're a decoration for the amusement of males starved of female attention, and you're not even very good at that. The psychologist somehow held it together, despite Gove upping the pressure, but he felt confident her resolve was weakening. He was getting to her. Something he was good at, something he'd rehearsed and practiced, sitting in front of a mirror, picturing her face, choosing his words, even his expressions, anything to make her twitch. He saw her stoic determination as a challenge to be overcome as he sat listening intently, searching for weaknesses, throwing one verbal grenade after another into the mix, simply because it amused him to do so. He waited with interest to hear what she said next, already deciding to dismiss it, preparing to go on the attack. This isn't a criminal court of law, Marcus. We're not talking about proving the allegations against you beyond reasonable doubt. I think we both know what happened. You agreed to cooperate with this process. At the very least, you developed an excessive interest in the patient concerned. Your fascination with his crimes went well beyond the professional. If anything, you fed his fantasies. We need to address that openly and honestly, if we're to make any progress. It seems that, yet again, I need to remind you that I'll be making a recommendation as to whether you should keep your job at the end of this assessment process. There are issues you need to address. He tilted his head at an angle, leaning towards her with his open hands held wide. Were they crimes? Her eyes narrowed. Sorry, what are you talking about? Isn't it obvious? It would be to anyone with even the slightest degree of insight. I'm referring to my new friend, the Hunter, as he was so appropriately referred to in the press. The gentleman you so flagrantly dismiss with your tired moral judgments and labels. Think about it. All he did was kill a few worthless vagrants, homeless trash, hardly a great loss to society. Is he insane? Should he even be locked up like some caged animal for idiots like you to irritate with your endless nonsense? I'm really not sure he should. So, he didn't live by your rules. So what? Who are you to judge? She screwed up her face, and he knew he was winning. For a fleeting moment, he thought she might start crying. Those women had a right to live, like everybody else. He couldn't reply until he stopped laughing. And even then, he giggled as he spoke, stopping between sentences to draw breath. He thought her contention utterly ridiculous one of the most ludicrous things he'd ever heard. And that was saying something, given her lunacy, the moral straitjacket within which she lived her life. Such misplaced principles, such unfortunate limitations. You claim they had a right to life. These dregs of society, the filth that lives in the gutters. <laughs> did they? Did they really? Who are you to decide? Governments kill with impunity, as does nature, wars, famines, earthquakes, disease. It seems it's the way of the world, survival of the fittest. Please think very carefully before saying anything else, Marcus. Some of the things you've shared are extremely concerning. Are you trying to be provocative? Is that what's happening here? He spoke more quietly now, his body language relaxed as he sat back in his chair, legs crossed, a single finger raised to his chin below his bottom lip. I'm told you have a strong religious faith. The Bible on your bookcase hasn't gone unnoticed. You're one of those do-gooder, god-botherer types who think they are oh so very special. But you're just a bag of shit, blood and intestines like everybody else. 
The good book is full of death and destruction, plagues, pestilence, and genocide. Where is your God in all that? Surely he must be the architect of it all, if your belief system is accurate. Or is all that the work of the devil? Is evil the dominant force in our universe? Let me know your thoughts. Are you as confused as it seems? Dr. Barton shuffled a sheaf of papers, the color draining from her face. It seemed she didn't know what to do with her hands. We're here to talk about you. You flatter me, Doc. Am I that fascinating? Don't answer that. I must be, or we wouldn't be sitting here now. It's all about me, my interests, desires, and thoughts. I bet you wish you were more like me. You're so uptight, so restricted in your ways. I've actually developed a growing admiration for the man in question. Harrison approached his activities with a passion. He killed because such things gave him pleasure. He sucked the juice out of life. He explored the very limits of human behavior and got away with it for six long years before the interfering police finally caught up with him and a judge sent him here. Isn't that something to celebrate? I was keen to congratulate him. I wish I had even an ounce of his courage. I'd pin a medal on his chest if I could. He has so much more to offer the world than you. The psychologist spoke more slowly now, as if she thought her tone might calm him, eliciting a different response. Frederick Harrison has a serious, chronic mental health condition, Marcus. He hears intrusive voices. His paranoid schizophrenia drove him to kill. He's ill, Marcus, and I'm beginning to think you may be too. Gove jumped to his feet, spinning in a circle on the ball of one foot before standing to face her. Well, isn't that just fine and dandy? The oh-so-clever doctor full of shit thinks I'm ill. Maybe I should take an aspirin, or perhaps eat an apple. Doesn't one a day keep the doctor away? I'm sure either option would be a lot more beneficial than talking to the likes of you. She pressed herself against the back of her seat. To Gove, it seemed she'd had enough. She'd soon bring the meeting to an end. Too soon, for his liking. But he was determined to make the best use of whatever little time he had left. He decided to let her say her piece before pouncing. Whatever mindless bullshit she came up with was a mere preamble to his dramatic climax. No more than that. I'm going to recommend to the director that you take an extended period of sick leave. I've seen a significant deterioration in your mental health in the time you've worked here. That now appears to have reached crisis point. I implore you to listen to me. You need help, Marcus. I need you to understand that. I plan to refer you for an urgent psychiatric assessment. Please take what I've told you on board. Gove bent easily at the waist, placing his face only inches from hers, and then he opened his mouth wide and licked her, poking out his tongue, leaving warm saliva smeared across one cheek and eye as she flinched back in apparent fear. The look of total shock on her face amused him immensely as she urgently reached for her panic alarm. She almost succeeded, but not quite, as he moved quickly, with agility and grace, and pulled her arm away, holding it tight by the wrist, digging in his fingers, not letting go. Oh no you don't, bitch. Don't ever make the mistake of thinking you're in control. It's always Marcus this or Marcus that with you. Do you think I might forget who I am without the endless reminders, you ridiculous woman? I don't like you very much. You may have realized that by now. You remind me of my mother. That vile skank was a bitch too. And as for my job, you can stick it where the sun don't shine. I've won the lottery, Doc. Almost twelve million quid. I'll be moving across the country. A big flash house, a new car and new interests in which I'll have ample time to indulge. I won't be your problem anymore. 
I hope you've enjoyed my company as much as I have yours. Looking at you cowering there like some pathetic, powerless victim is quite a turn-on. The psychologist wiped her face with a hand, blinking repeatedly, her voice faltering. What makes you think I won't go to the police? Gove laughed, genuinely amused. He'd never heard anything funnier. The police, because of a lick and a little grab. Don't be so fucking ridiculous. We both know the system. It's your word against mine. There's only you and me here. Where's your corroboration? The CPS would drop it like a stone. She shouted now, close to tears. Go and close the door behind you. I want you gone. Oh dear, so not very professional after all. You can go fuck yourself. I'll leave my uniform in the bin on my way out. Chapter Two Five Years Later Gove wiped himself with a tissue as his erection slowly subsided and he let out a long, audible groan that reverberated around the room, echoing off the walls. His exhilaration slowly faded now, feelings of great happiness replaced by the familiar sad regret that inevitably followed each killing. Not because a life was lost, not because he'd murdered again, robbing another young woman of her promise, but because it was over. He'd lived out his imaginings in what he considered a glorious frenzy of uncontrolled violence, visceral, explosive and orgasmic, with none of the self-imposed limitations indulged by weaker men, who would never understand what was truly possible if one embraced one's darkest desires without restriction. Frederick Harrison had known that, and he knew it too. But for now, the pleasure was at an end for another day. Nothing but a memory. The worthless bitch was dead, her torment in the past. She was free of him, and that hurt. It ate away at his peace of mind, engulfing him mercilessly, threatening the black shadow of depression as her blood began to slowly coagulate, forming semi-solid stains on his hair and clothing. Gove reached down to touch her broken hand, three fingers missing, the nails torn out, and lamented the fact her suffering was no more. If only he could go back, do it all over again, and slow down time. The killing was a wondrous experience, but it passed all too quickly. As enjoyable as it was, there was only so long the final act could last once he lost control, cutting her throat from ear to ear while simultaneously shooting his load. It all happened so fast, in a heartbeat, as the endorphins flooded his system. Gove looked around the room now, taking in the details. The total lack of furniture, the high ceiling, the bare floorboard stained with various body fluids, and he felt another deep pang of regret as the remains of his latest victim caught his eye. There was always the intention to take it slowly, inflict as much pain as possible before death take pleasure in the victim's suffering and savour the terror in her eyes, her desperation as she pleaded for her worthless life. But the excitement always got the better of him, the desire to inflict that final blow, driving the life force from her body, tearing her apart, became utterly irresistible in the end, as predictable as night and day. Whether he used a blade, his hands, or some other implement of execution, the outcome was always the same. And the blood, he so loved the blood. He was erect again now, as he thought of it, his penis standing to attention, throbbing. Blood seduced him. The color of it, the way it flowed, its scent, the taste, the metallic tang on his tongue as he sank in his teeth and tore his victim's flesh from the bone. Yes, he loved everything about death, killing, the suffering of others, but not his own. It was his needs that mattered, his and his alone. He was a man devoid of moral compass, 
that moronic sense of right and wrong that lesser men indulged. He felt no guilt, no remorse, not for her, not for any of them, the girls who'd suffered at his hand, who breathed their last breath as he loomed over them, appreciating their final moments on earth as the light faded in their eyes. And that was a good thing, that lack of conscience. He thought it and believed it. It was a wonder. He was proud of it. His victims didn't matter as he did. They were inferior creatures, unimportant, disposable, fertilizer, no more than food for the worms. It was all about him, meeting his needs, feeding his desires in the only way that was even remotely satisfying. He was an artist. There was a beauty to death as he created one glorious masterpiece after another. If a few more mindless females had to die to achieve that end, so be it. It was his mission in life. He felt the hand of providence guiding him, and so he'd keep killing in one way or another, one after another. Such things made his life worth living. Murder would happen time and again. But for now, it was over as he slumped to the wooden floor, still panting slightly, his chest rising and falling in rhythmic movement as he lay next to her naked torso, various body parts scattered around the room. He was weeping, warm tears running down his angular face as he whispered his goodbyes into what was left of her ear. If only he could bring her back to life to kill her again. But that wasn't possible. Not in this life. It seemed there were limitations after all. Gove rose to his feet, shivering slightly as he raised an arm high above his head, punching the air, howling like a demented banshee as a full moon, now free of clouds, lit the killing room with a pale yellow light. Yes, it really was over and for a time, like it or not, the memories would have to sustain him. But only until the next time, until he captured his next target. He held his hands together now as if in prayer, linking his fingers, his mind racing. May the waiting pass quickly. It was getting harder. He had to admit that. The waiting was agonizing, more so than ever before. There was no denying that reality. The time between killings had reduced, going from years to months and then weeks, and now it was time for the next one, probably the best yet, and she had no idea of the raging storm coming her way. Gove took his smartphone from a trouser pocket and flicked through the photos with repeated swipes of two blood-stained fingers left to right. Yes, there she was, Lucy, lovely Lucy, outside her flat, shopping in town, leaving her workplace, sunbathing at the beach in that skimpy red bikini he'd found so attractive, the color of blood. He'd never targeted a local girl, living and working no more than half an hour's drive from his large Georgian home. He hadn't even hunted within Wales, no zone of comfort for him. The hunting grounds of the far-flung English industrial cities offered a much safer option. In the poorer areas, the red light districts where poverty ruled and the vulnerable plied their trade, selling themselves to anyone who'd pay, slaves to their addiction. So why was this time so very different? He wasn't merely targeting a local girl, but a girl who was loved, with a successful, influential family, a boyfriend, an impressive social media profile, and a well-paid job. A girl who'd be missed. A girl they'd look for, the snooping authorities with their misguided morality. Why take the risk? He turned slowly in a circle and pondered his silent response, shifting his slight eleven-stone frame from one foot to the other, as if the floor was too hot to stand on. Because she was special. That was why. He'd known it the first time he saw her on the Welsh Evening News, an award-winning artist and lecturer, no less. 
stunningly beautiful, with her long, flame-red hair, sea-blue eyes and flawless, pale skin, so white it looked almost translucent, like the finest porcelain. That skin was aching for a blade, his blade. He'd never been more sure of anything in his life. He'd create a masterpiece of red, white, and gore. She should appreciate that, being a fellow artist and all. They had that in common. It would be so delicious to get his hands on her, and maybe he'd keep her alive for a week or two this time to appreciate the company, build the tension, and anticipate the inevitable final climax as he tore her limb from limb. Gove laughed out loud on considering the apparent contradiction, jumping up and down on the spot as he anticipated what was to come. Keeping a guest alive for a time was something he'd never done before, something he'd never even considered, not for a moment. The killing always proved too tempting once his prey entered his lair, but maybe Lucy would appreciate his genius. Perhaps she'd understand the things that drove him to do what he did. If he gave her time, there might be some satisfaction in that. But could he stand to wait that long before watching her die? It would take some determination, however pleasing their interaction. Maybe it was possible to hold himself back, just maybe, if he tried hard enough. And if she tried, too, if she said and did all the right things in the face of adversity, she'd have to suffer for his art and do it willingly. Nothing less was acceptable. He placed his phone aside and began ambling towards the far right-hand corner of the room where the decomposing body of a prior victim was propped up in a seated position close to the open door to the hall. He had no real objection to the company of corpses. There was no fear in them. They weren't as much fun as the living, but he could still find some satisfaction in the dead's total compliance as they acceded to his every whim and desire. But things had gone too far now, even for him. The body was stiff, the flesh rotting, her bony face more a skull than a person. It was time for burial in a garden grave, deep in the Welsh countryside, far from prying eyes where no one else would see. He pictured Lucy's pretty face as he dragged the nameless young woman's remains away from the wall. Now, where was that meat cleaver and the bone saw? Where the hell was the saw? The shed, yes, that was it, the shed. He'd cleaned and oiled them before putting them away. It was essential to look after the tools that served him so well. He continued his thought process as he strolled out into his overgrown garden to where a small wooden shed that looked well past its best was located among several mature apple trees, which always provided a good crop. Once the bitch was buried, he could continue planning, focusing on lovely Lucy and her alone. As he opened the shed door, he paused and licked his lips, first the top and then the bottom, as he pictured events, making them real in his mind. Yes, he'd capture her when the time was right, lure her in, and pounce before she realized her uncertain fate. It was something he was good at, a skill he'd practiced, inspired by his time at the hospital. He could be Mr. Nice or Mr. Nasty, whichever was needed. He'd play the game, hooking Lucy in one way or another, whatever worked best in the particular situation. But he had to be careful. He couldn't grab her off the street as he had some of the others. He couldn't just shove her into the back of a van or lure her in with the offer of cash or one sexual favor or another. This one was different. The circumstances were different, her lifestyle, the location, the dangers. This time there was a need for caution. He'd been watching her closely for weeks, something he'd never done before, and it seemed she was a creature of habit, which would help him snare her. 
Gove picked up his butcher's tools, closed the shed door with a grin, and began giggling uncontrollably as he walked back towards the back door of his spacious detached home. Yes, Lucy, lovely Lucy, would soon be his to do with whatever he wished, a plaything caught in his spider's web. He'd never been more sure of anything before. It was destined to be and written in the stars, and that was a cause for celebration. He stopped in the kitchen, placing his tools aside on the polished black granite worktop, having decided on a little light refreshment before continuing his night's work. Dismembering a corpse could be exhausting. He needed fuel, sustenance to keep up his energy levels. It may be an excellent time to open a bottle of sparkling mineral water, and maybe a sandwich, too, prawn with garlic mayo or lean beef with English mustard. Either would fill a gap very nicely. A man had to eat. He smiled, full of self-praise, as he approached the larder fridge, opening the door and looking in. He was evolving, becoming a better, more considered killer a predator at the top of his game. He looked to the future with a significant element of glee, like a loved child anticipating a birthday treat. Yes, lovely Lucy would be his. It was just a matter of time. Chapter 3 Lucy felt a deep sense of regret and frustration. Not the best way to start her day. Andrew Baker glared at her with an angry, sour expression, spitting out his words as if the very taste of them was disgusting to him. It had all become too depressingly familiar. It seemed he was witnessing one of the worst sights he'd ever seen, an abomination right there in front of him. Why the short skirt? More disappointed than surprised, Lucy turned to face her boyfriend as she prepared to leave their ground-floor flat for work at 8.15 on an unusually warm Welsh May morning. She glanced down, pointing at her hemline, before meeting his angry gaze one more time. She noticed his left eye was twitching ever so slightly. It seemed the tension was getting to him, too. It was all becoming so very regular. Every day she was forced to appease him in one way or another. This ever more hostile man-child was becoming harder to like, even slightly, let alone love. He was so very different to the boy she'd met at college, the one with a relaxed, non-judgmental demeanor and friendly smile. Happiness, it now seemed, was well beyond them. It was all so regrettable. Where, oh where, had that boy gone? Was it just a nice guy act? A mirage? An illusion? Sometimes she wished she'd never met him at all. What on earth are you talking about, Andy? It's just above the knee. He walked towards her, one step, two steps, as she went to open the front door. She waited for him to say something, as she knew he inevitably would, and when he did speak, it wouldn't be good. She felt sure of that. These days it rarely was. And that blouse. You need to fasten the top button. Have you even got a bra on? It's a little revealing, don't you think? Have some respect for yourself. Be a lady. I can see through the material when it catches the light. Other men will notice that. They'll think you're a tart. It won't just be me. She took a backward step as he stood in front of her, their noses only a few inches apart. She could feel his hot breath on her face, the stink of last night's beer filling her nostrils. Don't stand so close. Please, Andy, you're making me feel uncomfortable. Back off. She raised a hand to his chest when he didn't move, gently pushing him back, forcing an unconvincing smile that felt so out of place in circumstances that were anything but amusing. The smile was impossible to maintain despite her best efforts. What she'd like to have done would be to tell him to fuck off, to say it to him, right there and then to his face, loud and proud, leaving him in no doubt about her feelings. It would have felt so good, so very satisfying. But it wasn't in her nature. 
She thought of herself as a lover, not a fighter. The words would stick in her throat. For goodness sake, Andy, why this again? I'm dressed for work, and I'm dressed professionally. My outfit is entirely appropriate. It's almost the end of May. It's going to be hot. Did you see the weather forecast? It'll be boiling by this afternoon, one of the hottest days on record for the time of year. A bit of hot weather shouldn't stop you covering up. Lucy gritted her teeth, frowning hard and thinking this was the final straw, ready to say what was on her mind. Please, Andy, you've said enough. It's every single day, and you never let up. It's always the same thing. It's time to stop. You're wrecking what's left of our relationship, and for no good reason at all. What part of that don't you understand? His overly muscular shoulders slumped over his chest as his voice lowered in pitch and tone, melancholy, bordering on the pleading, a change of strategy she'd seen before. Please, change your clothes for me. It's not much to ask. I'd do it for you if you asked. She sometimes thought that his earnest emotional appeals were even worse than his anger. She knew she'd have to listen, as she always did, feeling she didn't have a choice. Once again, she wished that she did. Put on something more modest, he continued. A pair of loose trousers, maybe the pair I bought you on Saturday, the green ones, something less attention-grabbing. You said you liked them, so why not wear them? I could fetch them now, the hanging in your wardrobe. I cut the labels off. You weren't lying about liking them, were you? Lucy felt her entire body tense. She looked down at her watch, holding her arm out in front of her, making it obvious, and for a moment she feared he might start weeping again. He did that sometimes, and she hated it more than almost anything else. It was either anger or tears, always one or the other, and sometimes both. She wondered again what had happened to the man she fell in love with, the fun Andy, the confident Andy, who could be a pleasure to be with, the man who contributed. It seemed he was long gone, never to return. She reached for the door handle, and he finally stepped aside. She turned it, pulling the open door towards her, keen to get out of there and on her way. Her college workplace beckoned as a means of escape, a sanctuary. There'd been far too much recent drama in their lives. Andy had changed so very much, and not for the better. Maybe he was showing his true colors, or perhaps they just weren't right for each other anymore. She'd grown as a person, developed, matured, moved on with her life, and he hadn't. In fact, he'd gone backwards. The entire situation had become toxic, more destructive than she could ever have imagined. I haven't got time for this. I've got a job to go to, and I'm going to be late. I need to get going. Just change. You can do it quickly. It won't take you long. You don't want men drooling over you when you're walking down the street. It makes me feel like puking just thinking about it. Lucy's expression hardened as she resisted the impulse to scream out a string of heartfelt insults, something that was becoming harder by the day. She silently swore that she'd tell him exactly what she thought of him one day. But today was not that day. Have I ever cheated on you, even once? He chose not to answer, looking away. I'm wearing what I'm wearing. It would be best if you accepted you're not the boss of me. You can't try to dictate to me like this. If you want to drive me away, you're doing a damn good job. There's only so much I can take. He followed her on his bare feet, wearing only jockey shorts and an overly tight vest, as she rushed towards her faded red two-seater convertible sports car, parked in the street about thirty yards from the flat. Will you be home for lunch? Lucy couldn't quite believe he'd asked the question. It seemed so unreasonable, so demanding, so very needy, as if he thought all that had been said before was of little, if any, consequence. She unlocked the car, threw her tan faux leather handbag onto the passenger seat, and climbed in, slamming the door more forcibly than she intended before winding down the window with an electric buzz. I'll see you sometime after five. Lunchtime isn't an option. I can't come rushing back here and then go straight back to work again. I've got a full day of commitments. You're going to have to sort out your own lunch. I haven't got the time. 
Oh, you've got more important things to do, have you? But then, of course you have. Everything's more important than me. Lucy had a sinking feeling deep in the pit of her stomach. She bit her tongue hard, wincing, rather than say something she might later regret. I'm going now, Andy. You've said enough. Please, please, please try to do something constructive with your day. Even in the fresh morning air, she could smell the reek of his stale body odor as he placed the palms of both hands on the car's black canvas roof. What's that supposed to mean? Lucy considered driving off without saying anything more, but she decided against it. Some things needed to be said. It had to be worth one more try. Maybe this time her words wouldn't fall on deaf ears. Take a shower and take some time going through the online job adverts. We can't keep borrowing from my parents. It would help if you started earning some money again. My salary isn't enough to cover all the bills. He snarled his reply, anger now his dominant feature as it contorted his unshaven face. Another side of him she'd seen before. Oh, you'd like that, wouldn't you? Me doing some shit job while you swan around being the oh-so-successful artist I was meant to be. I suppose you think one day you'll win the Turner Prize. You're so full of big ideas. Lucy sighed deeply. She'd heard enough. She could have responded again, but there was little, if any, point. She felt sure he'd spend his entire day playing pointless computer games and lifting ridiculously heavy weights again. It's what he did every day, either that or spying on her, snooping, going through her phone when he got the chance, asking questions, making judgmental comments, trying to control. She started the car's petrol engine with two key turns, signalled, and pulled out into the road, taking full advantage of the sudden gap in the morning traffic. The car was almost ten years old, not worth very much, but still drove well. It felt so good to be driving away, a small victory of sorts. She could still see Andy standing on the pavement, ranting at her in the rearview mirror before negotiating the first bend in the road, losing sight of him. She reminded herself that if things didn't change for the better very soon, she'd have to end it. She'd thought the same thing many times before, but she told herself that this time she meant it. There was only so much she could deal with, however much she loved him. And did she even love him any more? Maybe it was all just memories of a better past, keeping them together. In some ways, the relationship had already died. At best, it was wallowing in its death throes. She had to face that truth. As Lucy pressed her foot down hard on the accelerator pedal, driving a lot faster than was sensible, she decided it was time for change. But maybe she'd talk things through with her mother first. That always helped. Mum was the one person in life she could truly rely on in times of adversity. Chapter 4 Lucy sat on the edge of her old wooden desk in her small, cluttered art college office, picked up her mobile, and tried to decide whether or not to ring her mother. Should she or shouldn't she? Yes or no? She still had half an hour or so before giving her first lecture. Time wasn't a problem, and she'd already prepared. Oh, what the hell, why not ring? Mum wouldn't mind, she never did. The decision to reach out to her mum wasn't easy. A part of her still hated placing any kind of emotional stress on her, particularly since the breast cancer diagnosis. There was always an element of guilt when she finally made an emotionally charged call, but she always made it. Her need to chat with the one person who loved her unconditionally and wouldn't ever sit in judgment, whatever she shared, inevitably overrode her reticence. Lucy touched the phone screen with her finger and only had to wait a few brief seconds before the call was answered. Hi, Mum. Have you got time for a chat? Of course I have. I've always got time for you. You should know that by now. Nobody is more important than my girl. She felt relief and pleasure on hearing her mother's familiar musical West Wales tones on the other end of the line. 
There was comfort in her mother's voice, like the cool side of a pillow in summer or a roaring log fire on a cold winter evening. It took Lucy back to a happy childhood. Lucy smiled, a thin smile, but a smile nonetheless. Just talking to her mother made her feel better. Andy has been at it again. Myra Williams let out a contemptuous snort. Oh, for goodness sake, no. What has he done this time? He hasn't hit you, has he? Lucy closed her eyes tight shut, shaking her head slowly before opening them again. Weeping without words, her salty tears soiled her face, smudging her mascara. How much should she say? Should she mention the intimidation, Andy's use of steroids, the money he was wasting, the jealousy, the anger, the scary tantrums? She laughed despite herself. Living with Andy was like parenting a giant toddler, the terrible twos, but in his twenties. No, it's nothing like that. Andy's not a violent man. He can be intimidating, and he sometimes frightens me, particularly when he's drunk. He's a big guy, but I don't think he'd ever hurt me. Not really. It's the jealousy thing that truly gets me down. I've never given him even the slightest reason to doubt me. Not since we first met at college. He never used to be like this. It's like he's paranoid. Lucy pictured her mother's frowning face before she heard her response. What about that time you had the bruising on your face? The slap marks? That's something I'm not going to forget in a hurry. I can see it now as if it was yesterday. You should have dumped him then. I've told you, they weren't slap marks. Andy reached out to grab me when I tripped and fell. It was an accident. I thought I'd made that perfectly clear. I don't know how many times I need to repeat myself. Men don't change, Lucy. Not fundamentally. They are what they are. They do what they do. Your father's not perfect. Nobody is. But he's never laid a finger on me in anger. Not once in over thirty years of marriage. If Andrew did slap you, he will do it again one day. And next time, he may even do something worse. You've just told me you're scared of him. You said it in your own words. I've told you what I think. It would be best if you told him to move out. It's you paying the bills. It's your flat, not his. You deserve a lot better. He's not the man for you. How's Dad? Myra laughed humorlessly. Lucy knew that sound. It was a conversation they'd had before. Are you changing the subject? Yes, I suppose I am now the lecture's over. So how is Dad? I don't think I've seen him for weeks. Myra emitted a long, deep, audible breath. Oh, you know what your father's like. Always working, rushing from one commitment to the next. What with his trips back and forth to London, the constituency surgeries, social events, the media work and everything that goes with it, it sometimes feels like I hardly ever see him myself. But I wouldn't want him any other way. I knew what he was like when I married him. He's a go-getter, a dynamo. He was no different back then to now. I suppose I've got used to it over the years. It's not like you've had a choice. Well, there's some truth in that, but I've no complaints. We've had a long and happy marriage. We still love each other after all these years, and he's never let me down, not even once. That's more than many can claim. Lucy was silent for a few seconds before speaking again. And how are you, Mum? Myra was quick to reply, as if she wanted to get this part of the conversation over with as fast as possible. Oh, you know me, getting on with life as best I can, always looking on the positive side. I'm a glass-half-full sort of girl. I've got a roof over my head, good friends and a family who love me. There's a lot of people coping with a good deal worse. It's important to be grateful for your blessings. No, really, how are you? How are you feeling? No more avoiding the subject. I want to know. There was a short silence, followed by a series of muffled sobs, and then the sound of her mother blowing her nose before she finally spoke again. Do you really want to know? I asked, didn't I? Well, the chemo's a drag. Being six, no fun at all, and losing my hair isn't the best look in the world. I won't be winning any beauty contests any time soon, and the wig is just too hot and itchy. I only wear it if I've got company. But other than that, I'm doing fine. 
You're so strong, always making light of it all. I think you're amazing. I don't tell you that often enough. Myra inhaled so loudly that Lucy could hear. I'm tired, love. I didn't get a great night's sleep. It's lovely talking to you, but I need to lie down. There was one other concern Lucy had considered mentioning, but she decided to let it go. It could wait for another time, when her mum felt stronger. I'm sending you a big hug, right back at you. Tell me some good news before we end the call, something positive. Say something to make me smile. I could do with cheering up. It would give me something to meditate on. You know, I just can't concentrate on a book. I so used to love reading. Hopefully I will again. I think it must be something to do with the medication. Lucy thought for a second or two, searching her busy mind.